What do I hear for this fine specimen? She's a young but excellent house servant, just right for childbearing. Good teeth and good health. Do I hear 200? Thank you. Have two, now three. Do I hear three? Can you imagine how being auctioned off to the highest bidder must have felt? To find yourself suddenly handcuffed and in shackles and be thrown in jail to await the fate of the auction block? Please stay with us for this episode of History Scene as we examine slaves and the lives of slaves in the American South. It may not be the biggest, it's just a little show with stories of Virginia and places you may know. It's about the times and faces that made us who we are. We'll take you to those places. We'll travel near and far. We have history around every tree. We have old time tales to hear and see. Our past will come alive again on your TV screen. While having fun with good old friends here on History Scene. Where all the places and faces are traces of history. You'll see us then, you'll see us now, here on History Scene. History. There is no one single slave experience. They're field slaves, house slaves, uh, big plantations, small farms. Some owners were angry, some were gentle. America's peculiar institution has many experiences, and we can only look at a few of them. I'm standing next to Fredericksburg, Virginia's iconic slave block at the corner of Charles and William Street. It's been here a while, and it's in front of what was built as the Planters Hotel in the 1840s. Claims have been made that this was not a slave auction block, but rather a step for women getting out of carriages or off horses. Perhaps, but there is lots of circumstantial evidence that slaves were auctioned here. First, there are two known advertisements for auctions of slaves in front of the Planters Hotel. This is the obvious spot. Second, there's a long-standing local tradition that this was a slave block. And finally, there are secondary references to slaves being auctioned here, including the oral history of two former slaves who claim they were sold here. But whatever the case, this stone, this marker, gives us a tangible link to a dark time. Slaves waiting to be sold were kept in slave jails, sturdy buildings often down near the river for good access to transportation so they could be more easily moved to southern markets. A slave jail that was very well documented by post-Civil War photographers was this one in Alexandria, which meant it would be near the Potomac River and railroads. Apparently slaves were kept in small cells and only had a minimal exercise area. I'm here on Lower Caroline Street. In Fredericksburg, this is where the rich and powerful families lived. Next to me is what is known as the Sioux Chancellor House. Yes, that's the same chancellor as the Civil War Battle of Chancellorsville, but that's another story. In 1837, this house was purchased for the trafficking in human beings by a man named Thomas Fennell and his partner at Mr. Smith. It was convenient to the city docks a block away where sold slaves could be shipped off to the cotton and sugar plantations in southern states. But then, as now, nobody liked a nasty industrial neighbor. In this case, the offended party was Mrs. Mary Minor Blackford, who lived down the street at what is now 214 Caroline. You see, the Blackfords they had five sons who fought in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. In fact, they were slaveholders themselves, but they didn't like slavery. Mrs. Blackford was head of the local American Colonization Society group. Now, that was a group of Southerners who sought to take freed slaves 
and send them to a colony created in what is now Liberia and Africa. Mrs. Blackford even taught her slaves to read and write, an act that was illegal at the time. She kept a journal that was entitled Notes Illustrative of the Wrongs of Slavery. Mrs. Blackford and her neighbors finally persuaded someone to buy this place, but at a highly inflated price. That shut down the operation immediately. However, Smith and Fennell just went elsewhere. They housed some of their slaves in the city jail and even down the street in the basement at 211. Mrs. Blackford wrote in her journal the effects she felt that slavery had on the white populace of the area. What is done under our own eyes would shock us to the last degree if it were not for this hardening process. I am convinced that the time will come when we will look back and wonder how Christians could sanction slavery. I'm standing a few blocks west of downtown Fredericksburg. Before the Civil War, this area was outside of town and thus a place where freedmen could live. Few blacks at the time owned their houses, so the houses they rented were from white families. The building behind me was built in the 1920s as Fredericksburg High School. Then it became James Monroe High School, later Maury Elementary. Then it was abandoned. It was a homeless shelter for a while, the police academy. Today, it's filled with elegant condominiums. But when it was constructed, that meant the end of the neighborhood as Liberty Town, as a free black enclave. In 1816, here on Barton Street, which was the edge of Liberty Town, a cemetery was established for both free and enslaved blacks. By the time the school was constructed in the 20th century, most, but regretfully not all, of the bodies had been moved. This newly installed plaque marks that place here in Fredericksburg's history. There is, however, one very interesting relic of this area's pre-war days as a freed black community. Remember these things? That's right, it's a school hall pass and you needed one signed by your teacher to leave the room and go to the bathroom. Imagine how you'd feel if you needed one just to go anywhere, outdoors, even to church. And that's what a slave needed. It was called a remit. It had to be signed by the owner or a responsible white person. It listed the slave's name and where they were going. Even free blacks had to have their emancipation papers or risk arrest. Any white person could demand to see the papers at any time, but the exception was Free Alley here in Fredericksburg. Slaves and free blacks could travel along this pathway and they did not have to have the papers. It was free passage. They could go into town that way. Today, this portion still exists. It runs from the intersection of George, Liberty, and Barton Street over to Hanover Streets. And locals still know about it and use it as sort of a shortcut to go from there to here. It's hard for us today to think of people in this way. But slaves were assets, and these assets had to be housed somewhere. There were all sorts of slave housing. The most basic was really an earth-fast cabin, dirt floor. Another simple construction would be what we call a log cabin. Uh, there were small windows, if any windows at all, and of course a doorway. The fact is, they were of such ephemeral construction that there's very little left today for modern archaeologists to discover. Some structures did make it into the 21st century. Those were usually better built urban structures or those that were built near the manor house and used by house servants. At Sherwood Forest Plantation, east of Fredericksburg, we can see one of the few surviving slave quarters buildings. It's a duplex, meaning two families live there, one on each side, and the structure has a common chimney shared by both sides. It isn't an original shape, because over the years it was added onto and upgraded for more modern living. 
I can't help noticing the TV antenna, which indicates it was used until well into the 20th century. Here we are at beautiful Stratford Hall on Virginia's northern neck, the home of the Lee family of Virginia. Situated along the Potomac River, where in colonial days they grew tobacco, corn, and wheat. But we're here because of the two recreations of slave dwellings that show where the great workforce of this plantation lived. House slaves, or house servants, were generally better off than field slaves. They had better food and clothing, as well as better housing, more substantial, such as the building behind me. Uh, this was close to the big house, and it is thought that people felt better about their slaves if the ones they could see lived in better houses. I'm here at the Wesley Payne cabin on Stratford. It was built under the direction of a man named William Wesley Payne, a man who lived virtually his entire life here on the Stratford property. He had strong familial ties with the plantation. In 1941, the then director of Stratford wanted to do something to honor Payne and asking, what did he want in his honor? Payne chose to recreate the house in which he'd been born and thus you have this being built, which essentially was a field slave dwelling. What Wesley Payne had reconstructed and what he'd been born in was essentially a field slave's quarters, removed from and out of sight of the big house. Buildings like this would have had a dirt floor perhaps. If they had windows at all, it would have simply been an opening, no glass. In fact, this is a great representation of a field slave's quarters. In spite of the fact that it's been around since the 1940s, it even survived recent Hurricane Irene, it's in pretty good shape. As with slave housing, slave clothing varied from one plantation to another and according to slave status. Generally, male field slaves were issued two pairs of pants and two shirts made of Osnaburg. Strangely, Osnaburg is still made today, although the modern version has a smoother finish. Osnaburg was an unbleached cotton and hemp fabric. Slaves also got a coarse wool coat and a pair of shoes. Shoes were not given to children or adults too old to work. On some plantations, a blanket was issued every two or three years. Sometimes, in warmer climes, children went naked until they were 10 years old. House servants generally fared better than field slaves. Thomas Jefferson's manservant, Jupiter, for example, we know he was issued a coat, a waistcoat or a vest, a pair of pants, and 10 and a half yards of a linen-like material to make shirts and cravats. They were cut the same as a contemporary Virginian's wardrobe, just made of coarser cloth. Now Jefferson's 93 artisan and agricultural slaves each received a, a quantity of Osnaburg and several skeins of thread that they were to make their own clothes. In fact, in 1794, we also know that Jefferson gave his slaves 60 pairs of shoes. At night, they would go to the big house and spin and weave and make clothes. I can hear that old loom humming now and see great cards of cloth coming out. Clothes were made from it. They were so strong, I don't remember what they used for dye. Some of the clothes were dyed red, blue, and black. They not only made our clothes, but also made our hats. Of course, they weren't very hatty, but was more cappy. Joseph Holmes, born a slave in Henry County, Virginia, interviewed in 1937 by a member of the Federal Writers Project. On many plantations, a field slave's diet was based on cornmeal and fatty meat provided by the owner. But on other plantations, slaves were allowed to create their own gardens and even raise a hog, but they couldn't tend the garden until the end of their usual 12-hour workday. Mama used to bake ash cakes. They was made with meal with a little salt mixed with water. 
Then Mammy would rake up the ashes in the fireplace. Then she would make up the meal and round cakes and put them on the hot bricks to bake. When they was cooked round the edges, she would put the ashes on top of them. And when they was nice and brown, she took them out and washed them off with water. Susan Kelly of Gloucester County, Virginia, interviewed at the age of 100 by a member of the Federal Writers Project. If the plantation were on a river, of course there were always fish that could be caught. Small game was available like rabbit or possum and those could be fattened up with cornmeal before they were butchered. House servants generally had a break because they could get food left over in the big house. At Christmas time, slaves usually had several days off and special meals courtesy of their owners. At Christmas time, the slaves were furnished with their new cloth, hats or caps, boots and shoes. From the oldest to the youngest, they would be summoned to the great house as they called it, and each man and woman would receive their Christmas gifts, namely flour, sugar, whiskey, molasses, etc., according to the number in the family. They would go to their cabins and for the next six days have a holiday and make things lively with eggnog, opossum, rabbits, coons, and everything. John Washington, former slave in Fredericksburg, Virginia, from his autobiography. The tiring, back-breaking work of a slave often left them completely exhausted. In his book, 12 Years a Slave, listen to the words of Solomon Northup as he describes working on a cotton plantation. An hour before daylight, the horn is blown. Then the slaves arise, prepare their breakfast, fill a gourd with water, and in another deposit their dinner of cold bacon and corn cake and hurry to the field again. It is an offense invariably followed by a flogging to be found at the quarters after daybreak. Then the fears and labors of another day begin. And until its close, there is no such thing as rest. He fears to be caught, lagging through the day. He fears to approach the gin house with his basket load of cotton at night. And he fears when he lies down that he will oversleep himself in the morning. Such is a true, faithful, unexaggerated picture and description of the slave's daily life during the time of cotton picking on the shores of Bayou Buff. Solomon Northup. They work six days from sun to sun. Usual work day begun when the horn blow and stop when the horn blow. They get off just long enough to eat at noon. If they're forcing wheat or other crops, they start to work long for a day. Sometimes the men's had to shuck corn till 11 and 12 at night. She used to make my Aunt Caroline knit all day. And when she gets so tired after dark that she gets sleepy, she make her standing up and knit. She work her as hard as she go to sleep standing up. Every time her head nod or her knees sag, later come down cross her head with a switch. Elizabeth Sparks, former slave, interviewed by Claude Anderson in Matthews County, Virginia on January 13, 1937. How could a small number of whites on a plantation control the large number of slaves that were there? Well, brutality, fear, intimidation, humiliation, and exhaustion were all factors that helped keep slaves in line. So how did slaves maintain their humanity? How did they find any joy in life? Well, we've already mentioned there were celebrations at Christmas, but there were weddings and there was the spiritual uplift of religion. 
one true legacy of their life is, of course, their music. Some slaves simply showed the dogged determination to live through their ordeal. Others just hardened themselves to it. Still others tried to escape. I saw such whippings put upon people. I thought they could not work. But I found that the poor place of accommodation had hardened them to such treatment that they had got used to it. I then said to them, look here, I will not take such whippings as I see the overseer giving. I can't work afterwards. The men said to me, son, what are you going to do? We are men and we have to take it. I told them that I would run away. They said, where will you go to? I told them that I would go to the woods and go back to where I'd come from. But they said, you can never get back there anymore. From the Journal of Wallace Turnage. John Washington was born in Fredericksburg on May 20th, 1838. His light skin and fair hair indicate that he was probably fathered by a white man. And had he wanted to, Washington could have passed for white. But he spent his idyllic childhood playing with both black and white children in Orange County. Apparently his mother was rented out to this outlying plantation because when it was broken up, she was returned to her owner in Fredericksburg. At the age of 10, John was living with his mother and was sent daily to work for Mrs. Tolliver who lived at the Farmer's Bank at the corner of George and Princess Anne Street in Fredericksburg. That's the building you see here, and it's still in operation as a bank. Listen to his words from his diary as he writes about his duties. I was dressed every morning except Sundays in a neat white apron and clean jacket and pants and sent to the bank to see what my mistress might want me to do. Possibly, she would have nothing at all for me to do. And if so, I would be ordered to sit on a footstool in her room for hours at a time when other children my age would be out at play. Trauma hit John Washington when his mother was hired out to someone in Stanton. That's a hundred miles away. And he was left in Fredericksburg for his old mistress's especial use. In his diary, he writes about the night before she left and his mother came to his room. Listen to what she said. Mother laid down on my bed by me and begged me for her own sake. Try and be a good boy. Say my prayers every night. Remember all she had tried to teach me and always think of her. Her tears mingled with mine amid kisses and heartfelt sorrow. Bitter pangs filled my heart, and I thought I would rather die on the morrow. Mother and sisters and brother, all would leave me alone in this wide world to battle with temptation, trials, and hardship. Then and there, my hatred was kindled secretly against my oppressors, and I promised myself if I ever got an opportunity, I would run away from these devilish slaveholders. The morrow came, and with tears and lamentations, cars left with all that was near and dear to me on earth. The History Scene crew has been here at the National Park site Chatham many times. We like it because it has so many layers of history. Uh, the front of the building is beautiful, the back has a garden, but today we're not talking about that, we're talking about the story of a slave at Chatham gaining her freedom. It started in 1857 when the then owner of Chatham, Mrs. Hannah Coulter, died and in her will sought to free the slaves here at Chatham. Now that's a pre 
Civil War moment. Remember, a woman in Virginia before the Civil War freeing her slaves. Mrs. Coulter's will, in which she offered outright passages to freedom to Liberia or any other free country or state, or if the slave wanted to remain in Virginia, she allowed them to choose their new owner from among her relatives. That was too much for the new owner of Chatham, Horace Lacey. He took her will to court and had it overturned, since the law of the land by the 1857 Dred Scott decision said that slaves were property, not people with choice. One of the slaves, Ellen Mitchell, was the laundress here at Chatham and lived and worked in the building behind me. Ellen Mitchell felt that she'd been promised freedom and when the courts took that away from her, she raised quite a ruckus. So much so that Lacey, who could have flogged her, simply sold her to George Ayler, the slave trader that we talked about earlier. That didn't stop Ellen Mitchell. She continued to protest. Ayler didn't really know what to do, so he did something very rare for the time. He agreed to let her work for her freedom. Ayler gave her permission, simply on her word of honor, to leave Fredericksburg and go to try to raise this money. She was successful. She went to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, and New York City and gave speeches about her situation. She raised so much money that when she returned, she bought not only her freedom, but that of her five children as well. Ayler was so impressed, he let her also take her mother with her when she moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where she's listed on the 1860 census. By the way, she owned a business. She was a laundress. And so, with those two stories of freedom, John Washington and Ellen Mitchell, we close out this episode of History Scene. Well, while the crew from History Scene is packing up, we've got an announcement for you. This is the last episode of History Scene. We at Heritage Media have a lot of other projects we're into, and we've got to concentrate on them. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed all the places we've taken you, and we hope you and your families continue to go to these local places. Now, we do want to thank the Fredericksburg Area Museum for sort of being our umbrella. They permitted us, through that sponsorship, to be on the cable channel you're now watching us on. But we want to thank each of you for watching. We got your comments both online and face to face. So that's really it for us here at History Scene. But we hope you'll remember History Scene. Until we meet It may not be the biggest. It's just a little show With stories of Virginia And places you may know It's about the times and faces That made us who we are We'll take you to those places We'll travel near and far We have history around every tree We have old time tales To hear and see Our past will come alive again on your TV screen while having fun with good old friends hear our history scene history around every tree we have old time tales to hear and see our past will come alive again on your TV screen while having fun with good old friends hear our history scene where all the places and faces are traces of history You'll see us then, you'll see us now Here on History Scene